And North Carolina is praying the kind of prayer of faith they do. C.D. Townsend's church in North Carolina, I watched this morning, a man come in and was diagnosed with cancer. And they loaded him down with oil and the elders laid hands on him. And he, I heard the kind of prayer. I, I heard the kind of prayer that he prayed. And he prayed that, God, we ain't praying, you know, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. He said, I, we ain't praying if it be your will. We know it's your will, God. We're praying for miracles. We're praying for God that you'll rise this man up and get that cancer out. When he goes to the doctor, it'll all be gone. In Jesus' name, for your glory. It don't glory, man. It glories God when people get healed like that. And the man went back to the doctor and he had no cancer. That was within a week. And there was another lady that from his church that was in, um, uh, had cancer. I think it was a young girl. And he said, well, they won't let us go to the hospital lay hands on her. He said, let's pray for her right now. And I listened to the kind of prayer. And man, it wasn't one of these wimpy little, oh, oh Lord, if it be thy will, heal of, the, heal of them. Man, that's a case I raw, so raw. I, that kind of prayer is so unbiblical when it comes to praying for things that need to be prayed for. Our prayers are supposed to be fervent and full of faith. But C.D. Townsend prayed, you know, God to visit that lady in, a, in her hospital room and let her be healed 100% all the way so she'd come back to church Sunday and give her testimony for your glory and your name. Now this is one of the Mac Daddy Baptists. He's one of the best preachers I've ever heard in my life. He's one of them that throw a tent up, you know, three or 4,000 people show up. You know, he's having a good revivalist. But imagine, man, when people start getting healed like that. They already are. In a big old, old, probably 150-year-old Baptist church. And imagine when he throws up a tent now when uh, people get miraculously healed. Imagine the glory that God gets out of that. Man, don't get no glory out of that. Man, everybody knows that, man, none of us what. Wake up one day and we just got some kind of magic powers where we can lay our hands on people and heal them. That is God working. It's called the gift of healing through the Holy Spirit. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit. But I'm going to read out of Hebrews today. You know, it's funny. We talk about faith this morning. Peter walked on water and seen a storm coming. And Peter was a fisherman. And Fishman had no sense to know you don't walk out on water when it's storming. But he walked on water because he seen Jesus out there. But he seen the storm and he sank. Jesus fussed at him. He's like, man, where's your faith? Man, I'm walking on water. You know, I, I see storms around me. It's scary. Jesus said, where is your faith? The disciples going around, they paired up in, in teams. Going around casting out demons all over Israel. If the way it reads, they were 100% successful with it. But then they run into one boy they couldn't cast out. Jesus chewed them out. How long will I be with you? Where's your faith? And he, he asked, he said, am I going to find faith when I return to earth? Or when I return? Is he? And we need Christians today nearly need to be getting our faith in balance with the Bible. Because this ain't the day to play around. This is the day we really need to get down to business. This is the day we don't need to be influenced by the world, worldly Christians, fear. We need to be influenced by the Bible. And if we're influenced by the Bible, we will influence people ourselves for the glory of God. But I'm going to read some uh, scriptures here out of Hebrews 12. Now listen, we're all, everybody in here, I'm pretty sure, is of God. People watching, I don't, I don't know. But once you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're now His son or His daughter. And whom His son is, He chastens. Whom His children is, He'll chasten them. Now, if I see a kid here getting unruly, mean, I promise you, I'm not going to chase them. I, there ain't no way in the world I'm going to go up and, and give them spank. But if one of my kids get unruly, that's a different story. You know, I'm, I'll take care of it. And that's the way it is with Christianity. When you was out in the world and stuff, you, you wasn't his. The devil's taking care of you on his own. 
But once you accept him and be your savior, things change. And that's something preachers don't preach about a lot. Paul preached about it a lot. David talks about it a lot. The Bible talks about it a lot. Once you become his, you better think about the decision you made. I've heard of drug addicts, man been drug addicts 20 years, get saved and die a couple days later. Why? Because they become gods. Once they become gods, they can't be sitting around living like that. I've heard of alcoholics be alcoholics for years, get saved, then go out and drink and, and die of alcohol poison, just, just like that. Why? Why did they make it 20 years all of a sudden they get saved? God don't put up with it. Because you become his child. But it's all out of love. The Bible talks about like three or four times in Proverbs about if you spare the rod, I'll say spare the rod, spoil the child. They don't word it like that. But it says you hate your children if you don't chastise them, if you don't chasten them, if you don't discipline them. Now, nobody in their right mind likes like, discipline anybody, punishing anybody. But if you don't, they're going to go up big old mean heathens and end up in jail or something. If you don't punish them now, the, the, the law will punish them later. And the way laws get today, you don't really want your kids to be turned over to them. I mean, I'm sorry. No matter what color you are. I got a friend that grew up in this area, passed out on the steering wheel like right there, and the cops blew her eyeballs out. And she got about $2 million out of it. It's the richest person I went to school with. But she wasn't this one good when she was growing up. And she got, and then the law had to take care of it. But this is serious business today. And if I ain't brave enough to get up here and tell everybody this, if I'm worried about the blowback or offending people or making people mad, then why, why good am I up here preaching anyway? And I also like to say to this church, church, let's pray for more preachers. I need help preaching. Thank God we got Sean and Tyler to help and uh, to teaching. And uh, but we need we need some help preaching and stuff. And you know, some of the preachers I've asked to come won't come. They're scared to come. It ain't nothing against our doctrine to have a belief. They're just afraid of getting COVID. Some of the preachers that I've asked won't come because their wives won't let them. And I tell you, you know, being called to preach, once I got my life in order, if somebody asked me to preach 100 miles away and I had to walk 20 foot in snow to get there, I would get there. I'd do it now if somebody asked me to preach if I had to work 100 miles in the snow. I'd go. But now it's like people, God said, hey, I need you to preach my gospel. <laughs> you want me to get COVID, God? You, you know, God opens the door, hey, I need you to preach my word. I've called you to be a preacher, a prophet. I ain't catching COVID, are you crazy? Hey, I've called you to get behind the pulpit and preach to my people. My job is to learn the Bible. My, my job is to study and stay in this and to pay attention and pray and listen for the voice of God. I take in what I learn and I share it to you. But what if I take in what I learn and I pray to God and I study the Bible and then my wife says you can't go preach. I'm going to get hard today. I need help here. Bean Station needs help. People are dying every week in this town. They're dying of drugs, alcohol, and just sickness. We need people in here praying for the gift of healing. There's some people who walks in it. What are they doing? They're, they're sitting at home scared to catch COVID. Then walk in the gifts of healing. Back in, you read the book of martyrs. Them good men that gave their life for Lord Jesus Christ. They find out a plague was going on 100 miles away. Guess where they went? 100 miles off. No. They went right to that plague. They said, man, there is a need there. There's people that need to be ministered to. And they'd go to find out where the people were sick. And they would help them. You read John G. Lake, find out about the plagues in South Africa. And he'd go and he'd minister to the sick, people dying all around him. But never touched him. Because he walked in that faith I was talking about earlier. But I'm giving a warning to all these people that's called to do a work of God. God chastens who he loves. God chases who he calls. The children of Israel were called by God for thousands of years. They lived right. God took care of them. 
They stepped away. God chastised them. The Bible's only history book that tells you the bad and the good what happens. Most historians only tell you the good. They don't tell you the bad. The Bible tells you the bad. The prophets would go out and say, Repent! And I'm paraphrasing a little bit of the Old Testament. But they tell people, Turn from your sins! Quit worshiping idols! Quit serving false gods! Turn to, back to the Father! And if they did, God spared them. God blessed them. If they did it, they were chastened. And I'm talking to my church because I'm responsible for us. Be careful that you don't backslide and turn your back on God. Be careful that you don't start slowly slipping away. Because nobody ever stops and says, I just feel like quit serving God today and just walk away. No, it's a slow, slow. Oh, man, here's, some, here's something fun. I just, a new hobby I just picked up. Slow, slow. Oh, I like this new TV show, but man, it comes on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. Slow. Man, I got a new job that pays double what I was making, but it's I have to work Sunday morning. Slow, slow, slow backslide. And then you backslide. God's going to take care of you. And that's the Bible. That's the word. That's not me making up nothing. Back around when my oldest son was born, around 2003, I said, man, people don't understand when you're called to preach. The first thing that goes through your mind when you wake up in the morning, man, I need to be preaching. The last thing that goes in your mind when you go into bed at night is, I need to be preaching. And you're constantly beating your head all day against the wall going, I need to be preaching, I need to be preaching, I need to be preaching. You wouldn't believe the people that are stubborn. I won't do it. There's times I won't do it. But when Chuck was little, I said, man, I did, you know, if I'm going to get chased, it's one thing. But I don't want the wrath of God to fall on the children of disobedience. And I'm getting ready to have a child. So I got back into preaching. And it went really good. I mean, I was preaching, I think I counted like 13 different places. I was going out evangelizing, preaching on the radio, preaching different churches and everything, different denominations. Man, I mean, I was loving it, loving it. And then I got caught up in some things. I got caught up in a new hobby. And I prayed God. I said, God, is it okay to get in this? And I felt just like the voice, almost audible. It wasn't audible. It was almost as, do it, but do not put it before me. And it seemed like I was offended at that voice. Like, like I would do that. Guess what? Slowly, slowly, I started meeting the famous people I watched when I was on TV. I started hanging out with them. Slowly, slowly. Well, I met some current famous people. Hanging out with them. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Getting caught up with all this hoopla. Slowly. Next thing you know, I'm out. I wasn't preaching no more. Next thing you know, I'm not going to church no more. Next thing you know, I'm working three shifts on Sunday. Definitely not going to church. Next thing I know, I can lean up against the wall, and the wall will fall in. I can walk through my house, and the hole will fall through the floor. I get a car, and open the door, and the door might fall off. Everything I touch... You ever heard people, everything you touch turns to gold? Mine was opposite. Everything I touch fell apart. You know what? That three shifts a week, I mean three shifts on Sundays, turned into 14 shifts a week in one job. And that money just wasn't covering everything. So I had to get me, you know, I worked at the newspaper a day and a half. It was like a 28-hour shift, you know, working right in the middle of all the 14 other shifts. Making pretty good money, but just wasn't enough. I was crashing I was burning. I had businesses, Gary, that was making pretty good. I mean, pretty good, pretty good. Four figures a week. End up losing money. Three figures a week. Has anybody ever worked 68 hours a week to lose hundreds of dollars a week? That's business for you when you fail. But that was me getting chastised. Because I grew up, I watched my parents, they never had really money problems that much. They're just responsible. They live below their means. So it always bugged me to have money problems. Worse than probably than sickness. But it was my fault. And you know why God put me through all that mess? To get me back to where I'm at right now. And a lot of people is wondering, Lord, why are you letting all this mess happen to me? 
Why does all this pain and misery happen to me? And God's like, what have you done for me lately? Who I love, I chasten. People, if God's got something for you to do. Do not be scared. Do not run from that calling. Because God will give you a mercy in so much time. And if you don't answer what you're supposed to do, you will get chastened. I don't care who you are. No one's exempt. I'll read out of Hebrews a little bit. Does anybody agree with me so far? Amen. Am I off? Am I, am, I, am I not preaching the Bible today? Amen. I'm thankful for what God did. I'm thankful for all them years of absolute, pure, torture, misery. And that's what they were. They were misery. Life without God is miserable. I'm, God, I'm glad God gave me a taste of that. You know why? Because I don't want to go back to it. Let me tell you about my life now. Opposite. It's the opposite. I have peace of mind. You don't know the feeling. Well, I'm not saying you don't know. Oh, the right word. There's nothing better than the feeling of doing what you're called to do by God. There's nothing better than a feeling walking in your calling and actually doing it. And we can all get better at it. We can all improve, work harder at it. But it feels pretty good being where I'm supposed to be. It's pretty good, man, looking at my families together. It's pretty good looking and seeing everybody that is close to me is in church. It's good to see friends I used to hang out with in church now. It's good to see people at this church together. It's good to see them talking to their children again. It's good to see things happening. I love that. Why? Because we're taking God serious. We're doing what we're supposed to be doing. I remember... My house payments, it wasn't that much, but I started paying with money orders. I'm not going to get into all the money stuff that happened to me, man, because I ain't got all day. It was, it was a nightmare. But there's one thing I was determined. I was not going to lose my house. It wasn't much anyway. You know, the house payments weren't that much anyway. I said, we're not going to lose my house. It's my grandmother's house. I don't care what has to happen. If I had to rob a bank, I'm not going to lose this house. I started using money orders because I had problems with my checking account at the bank. I started using money orders to pay for my house. So I paid two months money orders, and I get a letter in the mail. You're foreclosed. Foreclosed. And I called. I said, what's the problem? I've been paying, you know. I got receipts, money orders. And the lawyer said, oh, it's okay. So said, well, you've paid, you know. No, no, it's not what happened. I had to come up about $1,600 like that within a week. So I had to come up $1,600 and I paid it. And then their lawyer called me and said, Oh, honey, you paid. Uh, you're, you're good for three more months. Don't pay another payment for three months. I said, Okay. Good. Cool. So I get another letter three months later. You're foreclosed. I tried to call a lawyer back. She wouldn't answer this time. So that's strike two. Strike three, you lose your house. So I had to come up with like thousands of dollars again and pay for it. Now listen, I I was paying my house payments on time. I didn't do nothing wrong. So I had to pay it up again. You know, I ended up paying like way, you know, like $1,600 ahead, honestly, of my house. To, to keep my house, it was rough, man. You know, it was rough. I had truck payment, car payment. My credit was so good before I backslid, I walked to a car lot with no job and $500 and walked off with like two almost brand new cars. That's how good my credit was before I backslid. And man, I wasn't being sorry. I was working like a pure dog, way harder than I'm working now. But you know what happened years later and years later and years later, 2019, maybe 20, I think, think it's 2019. When I started doing what I was supposed to be doing, Ten years later, I get a check in the mail. I didn't tell mom about this. <laughs> USDA said, you overpaid us in 2010. Here's your money back. $1,600. See, there's a difference in a lifestyle living for God. There's a difference in you're on your own and having God taking care of you. Amen. There's a big difference in doing things your way and doing things God's way. And I'm just giving everybody a warning tonight. Don't turn your back on this. If I make everybody mad and they leave this church, man, you know, that's my stupidity. But 
My goodness, go from this church to another one. Do not stay at home. Don't use me for no excuse not to live for God. That if I go to the mall and kill everybody in it, I don't give you no excuse not to serve God. We all work out our own salvation and fear of trembling. I'm trying hard. I'm putting a lot of effort in this. But man, ain't no man capable of not falling if he's not careful. I've seen some mighty ones go. I've seen some mighty ones. I've seen a man just the more zealous they were. seemed like the more apt they was to fall. People have to take heed unless they fall. I'm going to read Hebrews 12, starting on verse 4. Ye have not resisted unto blood striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. One thing be thankful of, if you backslide and you start getting your brains beat out, at least you know that you're God's. At least you know he loves you. If you backslide and nothing happened, I'd get kind of scared. I mean, I'd be kind of scared I never had it in the first place. If you endure chastening, God still of you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bad words and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. And we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of the Spirit to live? Most of us, our fathers, we get out of line. We paid for it. We got punished. We got chastised. It wasn't because our fathers hated us. It's because they loved us. They wanted get us growing up mean heathens. Some got better discipline than others. I think as generation goes by, we get lax and lax and lax and lax. And we quit disciplining our kids as much. Oh, we're going to try talking to them. We're going to try time out. How about trying like what God said? If we're their behinds out. Not child abuse now. Not child abuse. But the Bible says, paraphrasing, you spare the rod to spoil the child. That's paraphrasing. It is in there. It is in there. I have to say, oh, it's not in the Bible. Yeah, it is like three or four times. Yeah. It, it actually throws the rod in there. You, and then, and y'all ever had to go pick a switch off a limb or off a tree? Uh -huh. uh, who likes that? Nobody. Kids, that's a nightmare for kids. But I see, man, just lax. They're getting lax. They're getting lax. To where there's hardly any discipline at all anymore of children and stuff. And again, we don't support child abuse, but we do support godly discipline. Even animals whip their kids and stuff. And you know, I'm going to throw this in real quick. I know right now, preachers, or, or people that's called to preach, that has went through absolute nightmares lately. They spilled the beans years ago and said they was called to preach. But nobody ever tried to help them preach. Nobody ever... Led and got them and, and stayed on them, encouraged them. So they never done what they were supposed to do. Not only did they suffer, their whole entire family suffers. And I left out step forward why I think God called this church this morning. I said, one, we're an outreach church. God called us to be sound doctrine. God called us to uh, not give us the spirit. But there's one I left out. And that is to help people get into their ministry calling. Imagine being called to preach and you go to church with four preachers and you got one service a week. How much experience are you going to get that? Now they got churches they just have you know one hour service a week, has several preachers. Man, if you ain't bold enough to get on Facebook like Billy Lee does, ain't nobody going to be hearing you. You ain't going to be preaching nothing. So I wanted to give an opportunity for those who are called to do what they're called to do. So they won't get chastened. Because you will get chastened if you're called to do something. And I only had, in my whole entire life, I really only had one man that really encouraged me and tried to push me into my calling. That was Paul Grisham. I don't know if you all know him or not. 
Man, he'd see me backsliding to the bone. You want to preach this weekend? I said, Paul, you know I'm not living right now. I don't want to preach it. He said, well, you, you need to be. You need to get it together and start preaching again. Even before he died, he was in a nursing home with dementia and stuff. Right in front of everybody, he tried to get me to get up and preach in front of everybody. You know, trying to help me. So I'm trying to help people too. You know how bad it hurts? Hey, would you like to come preach that? Go ahead! <laughs> and man, I tell you, COVID ain't, you know, it ain't nothing to bad eye. I mean, it's pretty rough. But I fear God a lot more than I feel COVID! And I ain't going to sit there like God's cast out man. Man, we can, man, I tell you, a lot of people survived the COVID. And I'm sure it's pretty miserable for a week or two. But God's chastisement lasts a whole lot longer. God's chastisement is a whole lot more miserable than COVID. I'm telling people today, get in your calling. Get off your rear ends. Do what you're supposed to do. Singing, teaching, preaching, going out in the streets, knocking on doors. Studying that Bible, there's, there's more kind. You being a servant, there was people out there in the Bible that just served people. It helped. Give the help. If you walk in prophecy, be holy again so you can walk in it. If you got faith, miracles, healings, stay in line so we can get some of that. God gives everybody a calling. Keep your toes on the line, stay holy. For verily, Verse 10, for they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit that we might be partakers in his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless. Afterward it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Now listen, sometimes holy people will go through some chastisement, go through some things. But that's God doing the pruning so we can produce fruit. Man, being a pastor of the church. God called me to be a pastor of the church in 2020 hit. I didn't even have no spirits being a pastor before. I didn't get no warming up. All I did is just sit through thousands of sermons or services and watch other people do it. Then God calls me to be one 2020 hits. You're talking about a roller coaster, man. It's being like this right here. But I knew what was coming. I didn't know it was going to be like this. It hurt to be looking out at the... The benches, and they'd be full. And then now they're, because of a disease, a flu that everybody gets every year anyway, they're not at church. It hurts driving down up the road. Churches used to be packed. And we go out and bus people, not even open now. It, it hurts. I drove by a church all the way up here. I said, one thing I love about that church, they are so dedicated. Man, they'd have like average three or four service a week, and everybody would always be there. One hour a week now. I seen churches that say, we are not going to cancel Sunday school for nothing. Oh, it's homecoming. You're not canceling Sunday school. We got singers coming. You're not canceling Sunday school. We got, uh, you know, a revival this morning. You're not canceling Sunday school. Now they ain't had Sunday school since February, March. I'm telling you, man, if we wouldn't have gave in to all this junk mess, things would be a lot different right now. Well, I wouldn't be watching my friends get sick like they're getting sick. I wouldn't be watching my friends get chastised like they're chastised right now. But I don't have the influence that the news does. They got hooked up. They say, no, pick at you. They got hooked up in all these scary movies. Like, ooh, oh, they like watching everybody in the end times, you know, all this uh, Armageddon and all this stuff. And ooh, oh, I just go watch these Armageddon movies, these scary movies, you know, with all these pandemics and stuff. And, and a little bit of a flu hits, everybody's like, oh no, we're in the pandemic. They think they're on a TV show movie. They said there's like 700 TV shows and movies come out about a pandemic before they sprayed this stuff on us. And the church bought it, hook, line, and sinker. Now a lot of them were really, 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 really regret it. You know, I, can, I couldn't tell you how many church people I've run into. Man, I wish we wouldn't shut down one time. I'd huff, I'd drink me some COVID if we wouldn't done that. Because I'm getting miserable. My wife was on fire. Now she won't even get out of her room because she's scared. 
My wife is on fire for God. Revivals was breaking out everywhere around here, Gary. We had a tent up there. 300 people would come to that thing before we started this church. Churches over that way. Three days getting the fire marshals. You're going to have to split it up. Too many people coming in. Hundreds and hundreds of people. Each service. It's like desolate now. Desolation. Because they're scared. You better be scared of God's chastisement. More than you are getting a weird, I mean a weird flu squirted on you. If you walk in the faith that you're supposed to, biblical faith that Jesus fussed at everybody for not having, you ain't got to worry about the COVID anyway. Wherefore lift up their hands which hangs down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Let me tell you something about church a little bit. It's not that I woke up one day and said, man, ain't nothing more fun in the world to go to church, listen to people sing and preach and sit there, have me quiet, be still. That's not my flesh nature to sit still and listen to anybody talk. That's not something I do, and it's just in my flesh, it's just something I just was born like to do it more than anybody, Gary. I never liked church in the flesh as much as the next guy. But I noticed when I was backslidden, remember what I was telling you about everything I touched would fall apart and everything? Finally, I had a boss said, the next person that asked me to go to church, and I was, was asking to go to church a lot, and I was really wanting off so I could get back to church, so I was miserable. He said, next person to ask off, and it was a nice guy, by the way, he said, next person to ask our son to go to church, you're fired. You're fired. I said, that's a sign me to get out of here. Because I'm going to have to go get back to church. I'm miserable. I'm miserable. So I remember that, I don't know, I can't remember what happened. I remember I stepped away from that job, and I just remember, it seemed like I got, I sold something or something. I just remember money was starting to come in. And I was starting to slowly get out of the hole. Now, God didn't let me get out of the hole overnight. He let me suffer in it a little while. We pay for our dumb mistakes. But I remember, it's like, man, you know, some sins I picked up along the way, some problems I had. I mean, I started going back to church on Sunday mornings at least. And I started feeling them sins just go away. It was just, I couldn't do them no more. I was like, man, God is really taking care of me. The Holy Spirit's working. I'm working my way back. He's taking care of this stuff. And then I stayed kind of lukewarm for a little while. I got back teaching. I lost my voice, too. I couldn't, I couldn't talk. I had to hold my throat. I guess I can't talk. It went quiet. I had to hold my throat. I had to hold my throat to talk to people. I was a waiter, and I had to go, can I take your order? And I lost it as soon as I quit teaching Sunday school. But when I started teaching Sunday school, my voice came back again. But I remember, you know, I kind of stayed. I couldn't get real hot. I couldn't get real on fire for God. But I sure wasn't going to miss on Sunday mornings. I sure wasn't going to miss that Sunday school. Because I figured if I get out of my calling, I'm liable to get back in a mess again. So I held on even with my string. I ain't going to lie. I had to do security at a nightclub. There's a restaurant I worked at, and they turned a nightclub. They made me do security. I said, man, I don't want to be here at nightclubbing. I would study my Sunday school lesson while checking IDs. Mom said, you think you need to be doing that? I said, No. But I said, if I quit my Sunday school class, then I'm not like to never get back into it again. And I said, if I quit my job, I thought I had a bunch of money coming. And I was watching people make $500 a night. I said, then I won't get make $500 a night. So I was in the rock and hard place. But guess what? God pulled me away. He didn't let me make that $500 a night. But when he pulled me away from that job, guess what happened? I started getting to go to church more. And then Jenny worked on Sundays. And the preacher preached. He said, look, people, men, you need to get your house in order. I said, that's right. Jenny don't need to be missing no church. So when she got back into child care, or not child care, but child school teaching and all that. And then I got to go to church more. But I was going Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesdays, and every now and then a Tuesday night Bible study or something. That was good. I felt really good. I said, this is working. And then God made me go to another Tuesday night Bible study. And then another 
Thursday night Bible study. So I was about five nights a week, but you know what happened during all that? I got stronger, and I got stronger, and I got stronger. Why do you think a church gets strong during a revival? Because everybody's going to church every night. And then nothing makes me sicker than hear people say, oh, the church is a, not a building. We are. The, now, we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. But if you look at what church is, it means assembly. And the Bible said in Hebrews, do not forsake assembling yourself together. Especially when you see that day approaching. Are we closer to that day or are we further away from that day? And we try not to drag on too much here. I'm sorry if I has to listen to me, but like I said, try finding some preachers come out in 2020. It's not real easy. Especially some it's at least halfway in line with the gospel. But I notice strengths come by going to church services. And I mean, I'm telling you, I might look hatefuler than a pit bull that ain't eight in three days when I preach up here. But I'm telling you, I'm as, I'm, I am absolutely 100% happy as I can possibly be. My life is just so blessed. And I want to tell my kids back there, you fall into sin, God is going to punish you. And you will regret it. And your dad will punish you. And you're, you'll get it from your heavenly father and your earthly father, father both at the same time. So best you just keep your toes on the line and stay in this thing. I tell all you all kids and family too, we got to take this stuff seriously. And if you're getting tormented by the tormentor, you might need to ask why. What's happening? What am I doing wrong? Am I slipping? Am I letting sin come in my life? Because you let sin come in your life. God allows chasing him. John 